Monsters of the Market, Zombies, Vampires, and Global Capitalism by David McNally. This is Chapter 2, Part 2. As if by love possessed vampire capital in a laboring body. The phrase, as if by love possessed, comes from Goeth's Faust. There is little doubt that it captivated Marx. In addition to citing it in the first volume of Capital, he also deploys it in his preparatory notebooks and in the manuscripts that became Capital, Volume 3. Describing how Capital seizes the surplus labor of workers and transmutes it into gigantic systems of machinery designed for further exploitation of labor, he writes, Thus, the appropriation of labor by capital confronts the worker in a coarsely sensuous form. Capital absorbs labor into itself, as though its body were by love possessed. The words Marx cites come from the Auerbach's Cellar chapter in part one of Goeth's Faust, which recounts a wine party in a basement tavern. During the party, one of the revelers breaks into a drinking song about a cellar rat which poisoned by a cook becomes sick and convulses with cramps as if its body were by love possessed. It is hardly surprising that Marx, who could recite long sections of Faust from memory, should have compared capital's appropriation of the laboring body to possession and poisoning by an unseen power that induces physical convulsions. But the position of this chapter in Goeth's text is also suggestive coming as it does right after a scene in which Faust signs a contract in blood with the devil Mephistopheles. Mephistif after all, not only does Marx too descend into a cellar of sorts, the underworld of work, he also reveals the wage contract as no ordinary transaction, but rather one signed in the blood of the laborer. Marx's descent into a cellar comes as part of a key strategic reversal at the end of part two of Capital, volume one, where we leave the noisy sphere of circulation in order to enter the hidden abode of production, the underworld that harbors essential truths about capitalism. This move reverses the whole trajectory of Western philosophy, which, since Plato, has sought truth by means of an ascent from the cave arising from darkness to light, metaphors which centrally informed Hegel's intellectual development. In direct opposition, Marx argues for leaving the arena in which everything is visible, where everything takes place on the surface and in full view of everyone. He insists on entering the cave, the domain of darkness, the space of invisible forces, and just as Plato's ascent is a move from the arena of bodies to that of forms, Marx's counter move involves a journey from the sphere of form value form to be or from from the sphere of form value form to be precise to the domain of bodies and their labors. As if to underline the importance of this move, Marx enlists a series of dramatic devices informing us that we are now about to follow the buyer of labor power, the capitalist and its seller, the worker, into the hidden abode of production. He warns us that on its threshold, there hangs the notice, no admittance except on business. Marx here nods to Dante's Inferno, on which the poet, or in which the poet entering the threshold of hell, reads an inscription that ends with the words, abandon every hope, all you who enter here. Marx intends us to understand that in leaving the apparently heavenly sphere of exchange, the exclusive realm of freedom, equality, property, and Bentham, we are descending into a hell, and that therein resides the fundamental truth of capitalism. As with Dante, so for Marx, the voyage through the sufferings of hell is essential if we are to acquire genuine knowledge of our world. In this migration to the underworld, the main characters undergo decisive transformations, finally to appear in their true light as unequals. When we leave this sphere of simple circulation, a certain change takes place, or so it appears, in the, in the physiognomy of our dramatis personae. He who was previously the money owner now strides out in front as a capitalist. 
the possessor of labor power now follows as his worker. The one smirks self-importantly as if intent upon his business. The other is timid and holds back like someone who has bought his own hide to market and now has nothing else to expect but a tanning. With this strategic reversal, Marx returns to the problem of the body of value set out in parts one and two. This is, I submit, the deep elaboration of his account of fetishism. Marx wants us to see that value is fundamentally about corporality, about the laboring bodies without which the spectral and vampiric powers of capital cannot take flight. In order to de-fetishize capital's logic of abstraction and disembodiment, Marx's critical procedure involves disruptive strategies of re-embodiment by way of reinstating the laboring bodies that are the precondition of value. Marx thus defetishizes by way of re-embodiment, and this move, I urge further, is not extraneous to his value theory. It is not something superfluous to the dialectic of capital. In attending to laboring bodies, Marx is in fact inside the dialectic of capital, tracking with irony and horror the way it subverts and reverses itself. After we enter the hidden abode, the dark cave of capitalist production, we are submerged in the shadowy underworld of laboring bodies, as if to signal as much. In the last sentence of part two, Marx suddenly shines the spotlight on the worker's body, instructing us that, rather than an ordinary commode or a commodity, the seller of labor power has brought his own hide to market and can now only expect a tanning. Henceforth, he insistently brings the abused and exploited laboring body to the fore. Alongside the accumulation of capital, he accumulates reports on workers' bodies. As he graphically describes labor processes, machineries, hours of work, wages, injuries, diseases, we feel the heat of the factory, the strain of bodies, adapting to machines, the cramped quarters that distort the human frame the industrial processes that make the body ill. Smallpox, tetanus, diphtheria, and other diseases are painstakingly itemized and linked to industrial processes that attack the human corpus. Marx's corporal turn in part three of Capital assists us in seeing the unseen. Amidst its noise and commotion, the sphere of exchange invisibilizes the laboring body. By confining itself to the movement of commodities after they have left sites of production, the market conceals the labor process, pushing it off stage into an unlit space. In leading us into the underworld of the market, just as Ben Okri will do in his Famished Road series, Marx seeks to nurture night vision to help us see in the dark, of course, or in the dark. Of course, classical political economy raised the problem of invisibility prior to Marx, most famously in Adam Smith's metaphor of the invisible hand of the market. Smith uses this metaphor to suggest that individuals acting in their self-interest unwittingly advance the general interest of society. In a fully commercialized market society, suggests Smith, an unseen mechanism coordinates and regulates the component parts of the economic system in spite of the purely atomistic motives of individuals. But for Marx, these unseen forces are much more ominous. Crucially, they involve the invisible threads that chain workers to a life of exploitation. Despite the legal fiction of a contract, between workers and capitalists, the former are, in fact, compelled by their separation from means of production to sell their labor. And once they have made this sale, workers discover that it is their hides they have delivered to capital and that it is a hiding they will re receive. Rather than a free agent, then the wage laborer is subjected to an economic coercion every bit as real as the political coercion imposed on the slaves of antiquity. But where the latter was entirely visible, encoded in public markings of inequality, the coercive bonds upon the modern worker are unseen. The Roman slave was held by chains. The wage laborer is bound by invisible threads. 
In order to make those threads visible, Marx descends to the sphere of the laboring body, exposing the sufferings to which it is subjected. He accents the body in pain, the body possessed and deformed by capital. In so doing, he tells the tale of monstrous suffering underlined by Silco. Three passages in particular illustrate this strategy of representation. The first invokes Dante and its description of industrial horrors. The manufacture of matches has brought with it tetanus, a disease which a Vienna doctor already discovered in 1845 to be peculiar to the makers of matches. Half the workers are children under 13 and young persons under 18. Only the most miserable part of the working class, half-starved widows and so forth, deliver up their children to it, the ragged, half-starved, untaught children, with a working day ranging from 12 to 14 or 15 hours, night labor, irregular meal times, and meals mostly taken in the workrooms themselves, pestilent with phosphorus. Dante would have found the worst horrors in his inferno, surpassed in the industry. The next passage enumerates some of the diseases fostered by the slaughterhouses of capitalist industry. In the hardware manufacturers of Birmingham and the neighborhood, they are employed mostly in very heavy work, 30,000 children and young persons, besides 10,000 women. They are to be found in a range of unhealthy jobs, in brass foundries, button factories, and enameling, galvanizing, and lacquering works. Owing to the excessive labor performed by their workers, both adult and non-adult, certain London firms where newspapers, where newspapers and books are printed, have gained for themselves the honorable name slaughterhouses. Similar excesses occur in bookbinding, where the victims are chiefly women, girls, and children. Young persons have to do the heavy work in rope works, in night work in salt mines, candle factories, and chemical works. Young people are worked to death at turning looms and silk weaving when it is not carried on by machinery. One of the most shameful, dirtiest, and worst paid jobs, a kind of labor on which women and young girls are by preference employed, is the sorting of rags. The rag sorters are carriers for the spread of smallpox and other infectious diseases. The final passage, um, prosaically describes the drawing of worker's blood, in this case that of children, and charges capital with blood-sucking. Where lace-making ends in the counties of Buckingham and Bedford, straw plating begins. The children generally start to be instructed in straw plating at the age of four, often between three and four. They get no education, of course. The children themselves call the elementary schools natural schools, distinguishing them in this way from these blood-sucking institutions. The straw cuts their mouths, with which they constantly moisten it, and their fingers. As his reference to Dante intimates, across these passages, Marx takes on a journey through hell. And here, he also finds a common ground with Gothic literature. It has been aptly remarked that Gothic tales owe much of their terror to their spatial settings, cellars, attics, chambers, long closed off. In the confines of such enclosed spaces, horror and death announce themselves. After all, what makes these claustrophobia-inducing spaces terrifying is that they are sealed off from life. From air, sunlight, human presence, and care, they are repulsive in that they bespeak abandonment and unlife. And so it is with the capitalist factory, which steals the time required for the consumption of fresh air and sunlight and engages in sheer robbery of every normal condition needed for working and living. If there is a Marxist Gothic, then it is one that insists, among other things, on journeying through the night spaces of the capitalist underworld, on visiting the secret dungeons that harbor laboring bodies in pain. Another shared feature with the Gothic is a fixation on corporal vulnerability. Bodies are always imperiled in Gothic tales, threatened by invasion and dismemberment. And in a whole genre of the Victorian Gothic, severed hands that haunt the living serve as a reminder of what has been done to the laboring poor. It comes as little surprise then to find Marx repeatedly mining Gothic imagery 
to depict capitals inscriptions on workers' bodies. Taking the example of the horrid sweatshops of the silk industry, he tells us the, um, that the employers sought out children between 11 and 13 because of the size of their fingers and their lightness of touch. The children Mark's charges were quite simply slaughtered for the sake of their delicate fingers. In these images of body parts, fingers, mouths, blood, Mark's limbs, the, dismemberment, the dismembering drives of capital. In so doing, he also underlines the corporal realities of fetishization. For if one aspect of, aspect of fetishism is the substitution of a part for a whole, this is precisely what capital accomplishes, fragmenting workers and reducing them to mere parts of themselves, and dividing labor processes into ever smaller motions that can be repeated with ever greater speed. Capitalist manufacture anatomizes the laboring body, fixating on specific organs, muscles, and nerves. Capital mutilates the worker, writes Marx. Indeed, the individual himself is divided up and transformed into the automatic motor of a detailed detail operation, thus realizing the absurd fable of Menenaeus Agrippa, which, which presents man as a mere fragment of his own body. As we have seen in the previous chapter, the tale in question describes Menenaeus Agrippa, friend and confidant of Coriolanus, calming the rebellious Roman mob with the claim that if body parts, including parts of the body politic, rebel against the belly, which he compares to the Roman aristocracy, they imperil the very organ that nourishes and sustains them. While Marx might have relied upon a number of sources for this tale, amongst them the version that appears in Plutarch's Lives, it is likely that he was most recently familiar with the variant preferred in Shakespeare's Coriolanus. And what is most striking about Shakespeare's rendition, as we have seen, is the way it employs tropes of dismemberment to illuminate social conflict. A Roman aristocrat and warrior who loathes the plebes, Coriolanus persistently insults the common people by comparing them to body parts and afflictions, tongues, bosoms, scabs, measles. In a particularly revealing exchange, as we have seen, he even addresses them as you fragments, as if to mark them as inherently dismembered. Drawing upon this play, as he seems to have done, in order to depict the fragmentation of proletarian bodies, Marx restaged social conflict in terms of corporal frag fragmentation. But while Shakespeare imagines so social dismemberment as purely destructive, Marx pictures the dismemberment performed by capital as destructively productive. Rather than simply an exercise in mutual annihilation, the fragmentation of workers' bodies is productive of capital and of the collective worker that might undo it. Marx thus extends an insight that the Roman plebes transmit in Shakespeare's text when protesting their hunger, the intone, the leanness that afflicts us, the object of our misery, is an inventory to particularize their abundance. Our sufferance is a gain to them. In offering up his own inventory of bodily suffering, Marx reveals it to be the means by which capital particularizes its abundance. The monster that best fits Marx's account of production via corporal destruction is, of course, the vampire. Time and time again, he reminds us that capital, like the undead, attains life and power by consuming the energies of the living, by sucking their blood. So powerful is the imagery that Marx uses the vampire metaphor three times in the course of Capital's long chapter on the working day. Capital is dead labor, which, vampire-like, lives only by sucking living labor, he first pronounces. Further into the chapter, he decrees Capital's vampire thirst for the living blood of labor. And in the last paragraph of the chapter, he warns that the vampire will not let go while there remains a single muscle, sinew, or drop of blood to be exploited. Three interrelated claims are bound up with these uses of the vampire metaphor. First is the argument for exploitation, the idea that capital feeds off living labor. Second is the idea of invisibility. Like vampires, which are creatures of darkness and night, capital's blood-sucking is unseen. Third is the notion of alienation, 
the insistence that capitalism involves an inversion by which the dead, material objects of past labor known as means of production, dominate the living, actual human laborers. The first of these ideas is familiar to readers of Marx, and the second is one we have already touched on, but the third deserves some elaboration. If the purpose of production is to create wealth with which to satisfy human needs, then the means of production, the tools, equipment, buildings, machineries, and raw materials serve as means to that end. But in a capitalist society, a peculiar inversion occurs. A means becomes an end. Accumulation of means of production becomes the end to which living labor is subordinated. Capital accumulates wealth not to satisfy needs, but in order to accumulate ever more. Accumulate, accumulate, that is Moses and the prophets, Chortles marks. The dynamic of capital involves piling up ever more means of production so that labor might be exploited more intensively and extensively, thus expanding the means of production and the machinery of profit making ad infinitum. Labor becomes thereby a means to an end, the expansion of the means of production, or to put it in Marx's preferred terminology, Living labor, the concrete activity of productive humans, becomes a means of expanding dead labor, the means of production created by past activity. Living labor appears merely as a means to realize objectified dead labor, to penetrate it with an animating soul while losing its own soul to it. It becomes the function of living labor to reanimate the products of past labor, to bring dead labor to life. As a result, claims Marx, Echoing his reference to Faust, the product of labor has been endowed by living labor with a soul of its own. Capitalism thus involves transubstantiation, a process in which equality, in this case life, is transferred from one substance to another. In awakening past labor, living labor raises it from the dead, makes it undead, Indeed, only the vital activity of labor keeps capital from lapsing into a death state. Living labor must seize on these things, awaken them from the dead. In so doing, living labor also alienates and deadens itself. All the powers of labor pro project themselves as powers of capital, thus rendering workers appendages of the animated monster. In a perverse dialectical inversion, the very powers of labor that reanimate the dead also deaden the living, reifying them, reducing them to a zombie state. Zombie labor and the monstrous outrages of capital. Like zombies, living labor under capitalism becomes subservient to and led by an alien will and an alien intelligence. In tandem, the mass of machinery to which workers are subordinated in production assumes the form of an animated monster, a monstrosity endowed with a soul and intelligence of its own. Factories, machines, assembly lines, computerized production systems all take on a life of their own, directing the movements of labor, controlling workers as if they were merely inorganic parts of a giant apparatus, as capital assumes the form of a mechanical monster whose body fills whole factories. Workers become conscious organs of the automaton. This reference to workers as organs of capital, which we also find in other Marxian texts, returns to us the returns us to the theme of corporal fragmentation. Laboring for capital, protests Marx, workers become mere appendages of this animated monster, dismembered body parts activated by the motions of the grotesque corpus of capital. The logic Marx captures was captured brilliantly in the 20th century context by Harry Braverman, in Labour and Monopoly Capital, Braverman showed how a series of technical innovations enabled capital to increasingly control and regulate acts of labour, as if they were indeed just interchange interchangeable parts of a continuous flow of capital's self-expansion. Motion and time, studies in particular, in which every process of production is broken down into a succession of smallest possible human motions, each of which is timed have served as a means for employers to calibrate any and every work process. Machines, equipment, desks, chairs, assembly lines, price scanning equipment, and so on, are all modified to decrease the time required to complete a motion. In a guide to office clerical time standards, 
used by many corporations. Almost every imaginable office activity is subjected to time standards. Opening and closing drawers, stapling, typing, opening envelopes are all so calibrated. Swiveling a chair in order to turn to another task should take 0.009 minutes, for instance. Abstract time, time measured and calibrated according to mathematical efficiencies, becomes the basis of concrete activity. As a result, humans become nothing but bearers of, of undifferentiated life energies, dispensed in units of abstract time. In Marx's memorable phrase, time is everything, man is nothing, he is at most time's carcass. What capital does to workers, therefore, is exactly what witches are said to do when they create a zombie to reduce a body to uh, to reduce a person to body to reduce behavior to basic motor functions to reduce social utility to raw labor as one critic puts it perhaps now we can more fully grasp the poetic knowledge embedded in many zombie and vampire tales such as those emanating from sub-saharan africa today which i explore in the next chapter these fables dramatize some of the most fundamental features of capitalist modernity, its tendency to mortify living labor, to zombify workers in order to appropriate their life energies in the interests of capital. If it is true that the only modern myth is the myth of zombies, mortified schizos, good for work, then it is in sub-Saharan Africa that this truth has been most powerfully rendered. And this is fitting. It was West Africans who, after all, captured as commodities in order to fuel the capitalist plantation economy, most fully experienced the mortifying, mortifying tendencies of capitalism. Indeed, Fanon's argument that the racialized and colonized suffer a kind of ontological death could be said to apply with greater force to the experience of enslaved Africans. By reducing people, sentient, creative, passionate, loving, hating, desiring humans, to property, capitalist slavery imposed a death in life. Even after the abolition of slavery, anti-black racism continues to reproduce central aspects of this life-denying reification. As the urban poor of post-colonial Africa struggle today to understand the forces of capitalist globalization that wreak havoc on their lives, they are drawing upon and reworking experiential categories derived from the ontological deaths of slavery, racism, and colonialism. In so doing, they disclose essential truths about capitalism. As Marx observed, when we turn our gaze from the respectable forms of capitalism in its heartlands to observe the colonies, the inherent barbarism of bourgeois civilization lies unveiled before our eyes. Marx intends his readers to understand this barbarism as real, not merely metaphorical. Capital commits monstrous outrages, he insists, from the extirpation, enslavement, and entombment in mines of the indigenous population of the Americas, the conversion of Africa into a preserve for the commercial hunting of black skins to profiting from the capitalist blood of children in English mines and factories. Capital thus comes into the world dripping from head to toe from every pore with blood and dirt. This is the point grasped with such acuity by Silco when she writes that Marx caught the capitalists of the British Empire with bloody hands. Marx had never forgotten the indigenous people of the Americas or of Africa. Marx had recited the crimes of slaughter and slavery committed by the European colonials who had been sent by their capitalist slave masters to secure the raw materials of capitalism, human flesh and blood. In returning us to, the, to blood and flesh, which craft tales from sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere disclose hidden truths about the capitalist mode of production. As we shall see in the next chapter, the most potent aspect of these tales is their rendering of zombies as forced laborers, workers compelled to produce for others. Not only do such tales capture the idea of alienated labor performed at the behest of others, equally significant they also interrogate the invisibility of the process, its mysterious and elusive character, which enables it to escape sensory detection. In non-capitalist class societies, such appropriation is entirely evident, 
with peasants and others directly handing over part of their labor, their product, or the money equivalent to the ruling class in the form of rent and taxes. But in bourgeois society, it is capitalists who pay workers, offering them wages, payment for their labor. Yet this visible exchange conceals the invisible counter exchange from which capital profits. For once they purchase labor power as a commodity, capitalists can squeeze more from it than the value of the wages paid. They do so by obliging laborers to work longer than the time required to produce the value of their wages. Everything beyond this constitutes surplus labor. To use Marxist terminology, a surplus value above and beyond the capitalist's costs of production. As ever expanding value, writes Marx, capital has acquired the occult ability to add value to itself. But as African vampire tales into it, this occult ability turns on monstrous exploitation of living labor on capital's werewolf-like hunger for surplus labor. Yet, because all of this happens in the darkness of the hidden abode of production, not in the noisy daylight world where all other commodities are exchanged, it is unseen. No wonder then that Mary Shelley shows Frankenstein's creature performing unseen labors at night to feed the de Lacy's, or that African vampire tales depict exploitation as a secret nighttime ritual. To grasp the invisible powers of capitalist exploitation and accumulation requires the night vision made possible by dialectical optics. Marx's general formula for capital, MCM, as I have intimated, is designed to map this invisible world. For once our eyes are able to see inside the dark underworld of production, we can grasp the circuit of capital as in fact having the following dimensions. MC, um, bracket LP plus MP, C, M, where LP denotes labor power and MP means of production. The secret of capitalist profit, surplus value, is derived in short from the purchase of labor power and means of production which the capitalist brings together in the hidden abode of production in order to exploit living labor. And it is this secret that Frankenstein and African zombie stories seeks to unravel with their tales of nocturnal labors. Marx tells a similar tale of transfiguration. It is one in which the free worker metamorphoses, or metamorphoses, metamorphoses <laughs> into the forced laborer, and in which the figure of the vampire reappears. It must be acknowledged that our worker emerges from the process of production, looking different from when he entered it. In the market as owner of the commodity, labor power, he stood face to face with other owners of commodities, one owner against another owner. The contract by which he sold his labor power to the capitalist proved in black and white, so to speak, that he was free to dispose of himself. But when the transaction was concluded, it was discovered that he was no free agent that the period of time for which he is free to sell his labor power is the period of time for which he, for he forced to sell it. That in fact the vampire will not let go while there remains a single muscle, sinew, or drop of blood to be exploited. It is time now to turn to that commodity, labor power, that gives vampire capital access to the muscles, sinews, and blood of living, of living laborers. It is, after all, a peculiar one. From the standpoint of the circulation of commodities, labor power appears like any other good that exchanges for money. But the peculiarity of this commodity is that, rather than a thing, it is a living power, an energy, a potentia, consumed in the hidden abode of production. Moreover, its consumption by the capitalist is simultaneously an act of production, generating goods, surplus value, and capital. Thus, the more rapaciously the capitalist consumes it, the more blood he sucks from it, the more wealth labor power generates for him. What the laborer sells, in other words, is her life energies. And those energies, and its bearer, the worker, are subjected to the tyranny of capital for the contracted life of the act of consumption, production. By a perverse dialectical reversal, the worker discovers she is not at all the free agent she appeared in the realm of exchange. Instead, her life activity is appropriated by capital for alien purposes. 
and the world of commodity exchange suddenly takes on a nightmarish guise. Rather than an expression of freedom, the exchange of labor with capital turns out to be life-denying. The exercise of labor power, labor is the worker's own life activity, the manifestation of his own life. And this life activity he sells to another person in order to secure the necessary means of subsistence. Thus, his life activity is for him only a means to enable him to exist. He works in order to live. He does not even reckon labor as part of his life. It is rather a sacrifice of his life. It is a commodity which he has made over to another. Life begins for him where this activity ceases, at table in the public house, in bed. On the capitalist market, human creative energies are transformed into things, commodities that are sold like any other. True, the wage laborer herself is not treated as a thing to be purchased once and for all, as is a slave. Nonetheless, she is compelled to treat her life energies and her time, the space of human development, as Marx calls it, as a collection of things. The worker sells himself piecemeal. He sells at auction 8, 10, 12, 15 hours of his life, day after day, to the highest bidder, to the capitalist. The worker belongs neither to the owner nor to the land, but 8, 10, 12, 15 hours of his daily life belong to him who buys them. Wage labor thus obliges workers to treat their creative corporal energies as, as divisible bits to be auctioned off, and this shapes and distorts the worker's sense of self. As George Lucas pointed out, commodification reorganizes the very forms of human experience, the ways in which we perceive and understand ourselves and our capacities. Commodification both reshapes the world around us and penetrates into the psyche of the human individuals involved. Objectively, a world of objects and relations between things springs into being, a world of commodities and their movements on the market. Subjectively, where the market economy has been fully developed, a man's activity becomes estranged from himself. Labor commodification thereby, thereby stamps its imprint upon the whole consciousness of man. His qualities and abilities are no longer an organic part of his personality. They are things which he can own or dispose of, like the various objects of the external world. The commodification of labor power, the transformation of human creative energies into commodities, thus daily realizes the absurd tale of Menenaeus Agrippa, in which human beings relate to their life energies as alienable fragments of personhood, as dead things that can be sold off. The secret of capitalism resides in this fragmentation of the laboring self, in the way that wage laborers turn over their bodies of value to capital in incremental bits over a lifetime. The time workers give over to capital is dead time, time separate from their real lives, a sort of death in life. No wonder then that images of the living dead proliferate so widely in the capitalist culture industry. And no wonder too that workers newly subjected to the pressures of commodification find this death in life anything but normal. Typically they encounter it as positively demonic, an unnatural and depraved theft of their life energies. In Britain, as we saw in chapter one, before workers became habituated to looking up the requirements of capitalism as self-evident natural laws, the horror of fragmented personhood was registered in riots against the, the anatomists, and Frankenstein gave literary expression to these plebeian anxieties about the processes of, processes of dissection and dismemberment central to the rise of capitalism. We find something similar at work in the vampire tales emanating from sub-Saharan Africa in the era of neoliberal globalization. But these African narratives, as we shall see, are no mere rep repetitions, emerging in the context of post-colonial experiences of capitalist globalization. These portrayals of occult transactions between money and body parts also probe the alchemy of finance capital, thus tackling a fundamental feature of capitalism in the age of neoliberal globalization. Money, capitalism's second nature. Before turning to some of the specific forms of money and financialization in late capitalism, 
we need first to remind ourselves of the uniqueness of a fully monetary economy, of a society in which money invades virtually all the socioeconomic transactions amongst people. The utter uniqueness, some would say perversion, of capitalist society consists in the way money replaces nature as the essential condition of human life. In all other forms of society, it is interaction with nature, with land, water, animals, and vegetation in particular, that guarantees survival. Of course, people's relations with land and nature in non-capitalist societies have often been governed and constrained by lopsided and exploitative property relations. Ownership of land has been distributed in grossly unequal ways and the majority has labored on behalf of others. Nevertheless, throughout human history, most laborers have had some sort of consistent possession of land. Working as peasants on small tracts of land, they have had access to the most basic means of life. Although typically obliged to pay rent to landlords and taxes to the state, and constrained in terms of where they could live, who they could marry, and so on, they nonetheless had land, both personal and communal, on which to grow crops and raise animals. A defining feature of capitalism, as we have seen in Chapter 1, is that it breaks this access to land by dispossessing people and throwing them onto the labor market. Indeed, we have now reached the point, for the first time in history, in which the majority of humans no longer live on the land. In depriving most people of land and the foodstuffs, fuel, and housing materials that come with it, capitalism fundamentally restructures our relation to the natural and social environments. No longer is basic subsistence, underwritten by direct access to one's own plot or via communal rights to land. Instead, it is money, and money alone, generally acquired through the sale of labor power, which provides the necessities of life. Without money, there is no access to the use values generated by the interaction of human labor and the natural environment. This, of course, is what it means to inhabit a world governed by exchange value. In seeking to subsume every possible item under its logic, capital increasingly commodifies and monetizes um, more and more domains of social life. No longer are goods essential to life, considered entitlements. Indeed, neoliberalism has been for 30 years refighting the battle against all such notions. Instead, capitalist society, particularly one cleansed of social rights, dictates that access to the necessities of life shall depend upon money and sufficient quantities of it at that. Money thus constitutes the basic form of the second nature that develops with capitalism that set of social conditions that makes up the indispensable foundation of human life and that makes possible interaction with nature and thereby human survival itself. In such circumstances, it increasingly appears natural that money should operate as the universal mediator between people and between humans and nature. By constituting a second nature, money does indeed govern essential processes of natural social life. As a result, the exchange abstraction, the social process by which people and things become equatable with one another and expressible in money, is normalized, albeit only after long social and cultural struggles and transformations as we have seen. As it imposes its form of social synthesis on society, capital refashions the experience of space and time, quantifying and abstracting each. The monetized logic of capital thus ruptures the human sensorium, substituting quantitative relations, monetary values, for qualitative ones based on the unique sensible features of goods. As George Simmel noted, the money relation hollows out the core of things, their peculiarities, their specific values, and their uniqueness. They all rest on the same level and are distinguished only by their amounts. And the same applies to human beings. They too are largely distinguished by the quantities of money they represent. Indeed, the monetization of a society typically ushers in frightening and disorienting confusions between persons and things, as money becomes animated with powers of life and death, and persons increasingly sell themselves as if they were things. Tracking the semantic and cultural disruptions attendant on the, mon on the monetization of everyday life in 18th century England, 
Margot Finn observes a constant slippage between the category of the person and the category of the thing. Indeed, money that talked, that assumed human-like personality, was a recurrent theme of English fiction throughout this era, just as it is in some African folklore today. Conferring identity, power, and social location, money in capitalist society truly is the regulating social power. In addition to governing my survival, the possession or absence of money also powerfully determines my relations to others. By constituting my relation to the market, money locates me socially, and the means by which I procure it positions me in a system of class relations. Money both holds society together, it is the common basis for social life, the mechanism of social synthesis, at the same time that it separates social agents into antagonistic classes. As the young Marx put it, money is the true agent of separation and the true cementing agent, it is the chemical power of society. A thing, something deposited in a bank, carried in a pocket or digitally accessed via a debit card, structures our relations with other humans. More than this, individuals acquire their social being in and through money. Without it, they, they effectively exist outside modern social life, as does Frankenstein's creature. It follows that in our society, the individual carries his social power as well as his bond with society in his pocket. The monetized social relations of capitalism thus simultaneously compel and privatize. They enforce a method of survival in which people, stripped of communal entitlements, sell their individual assets, mainly labor powers, on the market. Yet money also appears to, the great, to be the great equalizer. Everyone wants it, gets it, spends it. In the grocery store, my dollar is as good as that of the store owner. As much as money fragments and divides, it also unites all participants in the market economy in a network of interdependence and interaction. This is one reason why the source of profit and class inequality is so elusive. And it is also a reason why Marx's decoding of commodity exchange as a cryptic process of monetary accumulation is so indispensable to critical knowledge of our world. In undertaking this decoding, Marx deciphered the occult properties of money as capital. Today, however, money has become more awesome and more cryptic than ever before, and prone to great convulsions which reap monstrous havoc on the lives of millions.